chapter 13, verse 8 onwards, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others have fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So he is beautifully summing it up where he says, if you have love, you know, because all the commandments are based on love. And if you have love, then you would have fulfilled all the commandments. And he goes on talking about how we need to be loving people. You know, and he's going to explain that and he also gives a motivation as to why we need to be really strong in that why we need to do that look at chapter 13 verse 11 onwards and do this what is this he's talking about loving one another the commandment he says do this understanding the present time so do this when he is saying he is actually making a very strong statement he is giving an imperative he's almost giving them a command saying do this Understanding the present time. What is this present time that he's talking about? Is he talking about the 21st century? No, he's talking about that particular time that he, when he was living. And he is saying, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. So at that point of time, we need to understand that the first century Christians thought the second coming of Jesus was not some 2,000 years later, but what did they think? They think it was immediate, that it was about to happen at their own times. So this is what Paul is saying. You know, we believe some years back and now we know that it is very, very near. The coming of Christ is very near. So be very careful that you be a part of the kingdom of God. And he says, get out of your slumber and because your salvation is near. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy he goes on saying what are these things that he is saying he calls calls these things you know things of the darkness where he says well, what are these things as already he al uh, he already said in the previous passage all these commandments are based on love so if you do not love then you will have all of those things what is debauchery what is uh, 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 immorality what is uh, dissension what is uh, drunkenness carousing he is saying see enjoyment is okay but at the same time indulgence in anything becomes self-love, okay? So love for others is what he's talking about. Self-love is why we indulge in things, right? You understand this? When we do something more than we are supposed to do, then that means that we are loving ourselves more than other people, and we don't care who gets hurt in the process. It's all about me and me and me all the time. So Paul is saying, you know, it is not about love for yourself, but it's for love for others, and that's why he says, these are deeds of darkness, and especially be very careful, Paul says to the people that he's writing to, because the coming of the Lord is very near. We don't want to be people of the darkness. We want to be people of the light, and he goes on saying, rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Again, he is not talking about no, uh, no enjoyment at all, no pleasure at all. He is talking about this indulgence where he is saying, be very careful that you do not become a self-centered, selfish person who thinks about your own self all the time, self-love. And he says it should always be other-centered. So that's just the introduction. And then he goes on. You understand what he is trying to say? He is talking about love, which is actually the fulfillment of all the commandments. And if you love one another, basically all the commandments are fulfilled. And then he goes on to say, it is very urgent that you receive this message and full put it into practice because we don't have much time, he goes on saying. And that is very true of all, for all of us. We should not be putting off things for later. The coming of the Lord or our own demise, we can never predict. Yes? So we need to be careful and uh, that we, we, we understand that the short time is short. Let's not say, oh, let's not have a calendar and a calculator and say, you know what, this has not happened, this has not happened, the coming of the Lord is going to you know, happen at this point of time or that point of time. Paul is saying, no, 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 no calculations there. You remember that it's going to be any time. It might be you meeting him before that or him meeting you. It doesn't matter. But we need to be very careful because the time is very short. He says, be people who put others before you, all right? Chapter 14, and how do you love? This is what he's going to talk about. How do you love? He says, love others. And he said, yeah, in a very, very condensed manner that you should not be loving yourself but loving others. That's the fulfillment of the commandment. And then he goes on talking about how to love. Look at this. Accept the one whose faith is weak. Chapter 14, verse 1. Without quarreling over disputable matters. He's saying these matters are disputable, yes, but you don't quarrel about that. About that. It looks like a contradiction. You know, disputable matters, meaning 
matters that could be disputed about. And he says, do not quarrel about them, even disputable matters. What are, he, what are the things that he's talking about? One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. And it's a little bit humorous, yeah? Because he says anyone who's, uh, who eats meat is a, not just a stronger person, but is also strong in faith, okay? And he says, and anyone who does not, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. Okay. At that point of time, we need to understand. So I'm not saying vegetarians are weaker people. Okay. Don't, don't misunderstand me at all. You can be whatever you want to be. It's all right. The point is, Paul is talking about in that time when uh, we, we have the Jews, we have the Gentiles. That's a, a very, what do I say? That, that, that collaboration, we do not know how it worked at all. Because they are totally different. The Jewish people have been ha having their laws of clean, uh, you know, clean animals, unclean animals, this to eat, this cannot be eaten. On this day you need to do this, and on this day you cannot do this. All these things. And you have the Gentiles who have been having different kind of religious idea. And now they come to Christ and all, both of them are sitting together at the same table. And they are all a part of the same congregation. So today we, we find it difficult to really understand because we all, we don't know what culture we come from, really. I mean, uh, we, are, we, all, we all have, you know, mixed culture, basically, especially if you live in a city, yes or no, you know, you don't, yeah, everything goes, it's okay, you know, that's your food, that's okay, we don't mind it, that's the way you dress, we don't mind it, okay, because we, we are used to that, but for them, we need to understand, they come from very conservative mindset, where you have the Jews, where you have the Gentiles, both of them, all of a sudden, put together in the same place, and now, there are going to be, what? Problems, yes, they are going to be misunderstandings and Paul is saying, yeah, they are disputable things in that sense that you are different, both of you are different, but let there be no fight. And in terms of food, he goes on saying, the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? So what is he talking about? If there are cultural differences, if there are differences in conviction, you know, not about theology, if it is a wrong understanding about God, then there is a, we need to teach them that this is right, this is wrong, right? But when it comes to cultural things, you know, whether you eat meat or not eat meat, I mean, what, what, what's going to happen is either, it's all body, it's all the flesh, okay? Uh, either you spend on non-veg or veg, it doesn't matter. For God, it doesn't matter. You understand that? Yes or no? You know, some people say, oh, I fast because I, I want to skip my meal and somehow glorify God. I say, yeah, why do you, how, do you, how does skipping your meal glorify God? How does it do? We have no idea at all. You're saving maybe 100 rupees, right? So that's, that's good for you, not for God. How is it good for God? You know, sometimes we do all of these things. Okay, but Paul is saying, unless it is a theological issue of understanding God, if there is a misunderstanding, yeah, you can talk to them and say, right, this is wrong, we need to set that right. But if it is simple things like food, yeah, they are different, their culture is different, they are speaking a little bit differently, they are walking a little bit differently, they are talking a little bit differently, it doesn't matter. He says, do not make it a problem. Why? Because... Because love for one another. You get that? So that is what Paul is talking about. So the sympathetic idea, the sympathetic uh, 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 mindset of, of, of understanding where they stand. You know, sometimes it becomes difficult if you stand on a higher ground, especially if you think that you're strong, especially if you think, oh, this is not wrong, that is not wrong, the Bible is, does not teach about this as wrong. And when someone says this is wrong, that is wrong, and they take it as though it is from the Bible, it's very difficult for you to stand there and uh, not say anything. Yes or no? Right? The cultural things Paul is saying doesn't matter. Right? Who are you to judge someone else's seven? What does he mean by, by this? He is saying that person is also acknowledged by God. Whether he eats meat or not, he is also acknowledged by God. He is also, God is still the master of that person. How dare you... Point that point your finger at him and judge that person because God is still the master of that person as well. So look at the look at the uh, argument he is giving. Who are you to judge judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. So if they stand or fall, it's it's between God and them. You don't worry about that, okay? So he says, what does he say? That you do not judge other people. You do not treat other people with with contempt just because they are different from. You. 
that because they are, they, their culture is different, the way of uh, doing things is different, let's not make it a major problem. As I told you, in a, in a church like this, maybe, you know, in a, in a city, uh, you know, it might not be a problem. But today, you know, we need to look at uh, various other places. Even in Christianity, you have problems of caste, yes? There is a rift, you know, churches get slip, split along caste lines. Do you know that? Even in Chennai, I've heard, uh, you know, churches being split on caste lines, where it said, this, this church belongs to this caste, and, you know, we don't want to be a part of that. Therefore, make a split and have a church for my, our own because, you know, somehow, you know, look at that. How horrible is that? You know, Paul is saying even for little things, you know, you can't do that, right? You can't make splits. You know, you need to be able to accept other people as they Ah, yeah, you need to teach them certain things, right? Certain things in the sense of theological things, right things, understanding God, you need to teach. But at the same time, cultural things, what's wrong with another culture? Why do you have to defy them? Paul is saying you cannot do that because that, that would be undermining their master who has accepted them. You get it? So beautifully, Paul goes on talking about that. Verse number five, one person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another considers every day alike. Each one, each one of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. You know, here we have the Jews who are looking at these days and things like that. And Paul is saying, okay, let's, harmony is much more important than if it is a minor issue. If it's a major issue, we need to talk about that. If it's a minor issue, don't make it a big deal because you love the other person you understand this so we need to teach yeah should we not teach you know this is again a question when we read this you know it's almost a, like a question and you know, someone says uh, this is uh, this is how i do it you know should we just go along with that or say you know through, uh, when we know the bible you don't have to do that in fact why do you do that if there is no reason should we talk about that yeah we can paul gives a, a, a you know uh, gives us freedom to do that but at the same time he says don't judge okay verse number seven for none of us live for ourselves alone because even the person who does that he is doing it for god giving thanks to god and none of us dies for ourselves alone if we live we live for the lord if we die we die for the lord so what whether we live or die we belong to the lord for this very reason christ died and returned to life so that he might be the lord of both the dead and the living so he is saying anyone who does in the lord if someone is saying i will not eat this somehow you know i think that i'm glorifying god by that he says at this point of time because the time is again for him the time is short and for him and that is why even in certain passages he would say don't get married so obviously we don't take that right He's talking to the Corinthian people where he is talking about, you know, uh, if you are even pledged to get married because the time is so very near, you don't have to die time to go and get married, you know, get engaged and all of those things. He says, you know, don't go, go and do the Lord's work, you know. At one point of time, he also does that. So because in the scenario where for him time is very short, you don't even have time to, you know, talk about all of these things. He says, don't do that. But what we understand from that. Yeah, if you have time, try to t speak to people, get them to have a right perception and things like that. But do not judge. Do not, you know, destroy their faith is what Paul is trying to say. Okay. He goes on. Verse number 10. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So he says, don't judge anyone. Let them give account to God. So he is talking about the sympathetic heart that we need to have if we love one another. Yeah, we understand that people are, might be different from us and everybody doesn't have to be the same way that we are. If they understand God properly, if they have a right relationship with God, they are still safe and they are still saved. And you don't have to talk about minor things, about what to wear, what not to wear, you know, whether to uh, eat this or not to eat this. Okay, don't major on on minor issues okay so certain times this is what we go on talking about is it okay to do this is it okay to do that you know what about that person who does that okay let's not talk about all of these things okay let's not talk about that is what he's saying don't alienate people based on very minor things that they might walk away from God okay because you have sympathy for them therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another, he said, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I'm convinced being fully persuaded in the Lord, Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. So Paul is saying, I believe that nothing is unclean in itself. And a, man, a Jew talking this, you know, is, is, is kind of very radical. Because for them, they have the clean animals and the unclean animals. Yes? Remember that when Peter was there uh, uh, before in, in, the, in the town of Joppa, where there was this, God brought this whale down. 
and all the animals were there and God said to him, what? Kill and eat. And if we were there, some of us, we would have said happily, right, please, this is what we were expecting. But Peter somehow says, oh, how can I eat all of those things? Unclean animals, right? And uh, God said, how dare you call things that I can't call clean, unclean? Because, you know, he was trying to change the mindset that Peter was having regarding the Gentiles, you know, who had a different food habit altogether. So here Paul is saying, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. So where does that cleanliness or uncleanliness, whether to eat or not, come from? Not from God's law, but from who decides that? From within, he says. That's a personal conviction. So he says, if for a person who believes that it is unclean, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed about because of what you eat, you are no, no longer acting, acting in love. And this, could, this is very, very radical. Okay, Where he says, if your brother or sister is distressed by what you eat, he says, even forego that. Because for you, who's important? The person is important, not your food. For us, it's always the other way around, right? <laughs> I don't care what you think, okay? It's, it's, I'm going to eat, right? I mean, this is the way he, we are. But what Paul is trying to say is, people are more important than your food. I know it sounds a little bit uh, too, uh, 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 what? Yeah, I can't do. But Paul is saying, because we love people. And that is why Paul would say, I became a you know, Roman to a Rome, a Jew to Jew, a Greek to a Greek. You know why? Because for me, people, saving people, helping them, being a part of the kingdom is much more important than my own biases and prejudices. Hallelujah. So we might have our own convictions, right? If that conviction is going to put someone away from the faith, that is when we need to be careful. If you dialogue with them, it's fine. You can dialogue with someone and try to say, hey, this is okay, this is not okay. You know, why do we do this? Why don't we do this? Dialoguing is okay. But if that is going to cause someone to be distressed and even be destroyed, that is what Paul is going to talk about here, right? Look at that. He is not only talking about distress. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. How do you destroy someone by eating your food? How do you destroy someone? Isn't that a too, too strong a statement? Distressing is okay. Destroying. He's saying, by your eating, don't destroy someone else. How do you destroy someone with your food? That's what I said, the Jewish people. For them, unclean animal. Here is a Gentile who's sitting, sitting next to him and eating something so very unclean for the Jew, right next to him. And this guy is going to, you know, not feel good about it. And he's going to say, you know, I don't want to be a part of this, you know, group anymore. He's going to walk away. Thereby, he is saying, losing, if at all that person is going to lose their salvation and destroy themselves, he's saying, Are you, is your food so very important? Maybe for our culture, it might not uh, translate that way, as I told you, right? For us, it doesn't matter. But what we need to consider is be mindful of others that your convictions do not put other people out of their faith and destroy them for Christ died for them. Their salvation is much more important than your food. If you not eating non-veg is going to help someone be saved, eat at home, right? <laughs> yeah, we always have a loophole, yes? Don't eat it before them, right? Yeah. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. You know this is good, but let it not be spoken of as evil because at, for that person, it still is evil. Okay, And let your good not make that feel, person feel that you are an evil person. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he is talking about how peace is so very important. You know, having harmony, being living in harmony with one another is so very important because the kingdom of God is not about eating or drinking, right? It's about people. It's about relationships. You know, why would you sacrifice a relationship for the sake of food? Why would you want to, a person to walk away from the kingdom just because you can't, you know, control your food habit or maybe sacrifice a little bit regarding your food habit? Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. So when you do that, when you make a little bit of a sacrifice, when you're pleasing God by saying that person is much more Important, I want that person also be a, to be a part of the kingdom. And also, you are, get the approval of that person. So I know it sounds a little bit uh, uh, too, too radical for us to follow, but at least try to make this, that people are more important than our culture, our likings and dislikes. And therefore, if you're going to lose a person just because you're not able to, you know, make a little bit sacrifice here and there, regarding your food or your dress or, uh, you know, any of these things, you know, for us, we need to always think, 
they are more important. All right? So this is what he says. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So he is saying, be very careful that it will not become a stumbling for other people. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. So he's not saying change your belief. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Look at this, verse number 23. I want you to look at this. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat. What does he mean? If someone, as I told you, someone is saying, hey, I, I have never you know, eaten this. And somehow they feel that this is not something they should be doing. And you force them to do it and if they do it without being convinced, he is saying it is sin. You are causing someone to sin because that person's uh, you know, conscience is going to keep on prick you know, and uh, it's going to make, them, uh, make it a problem. It might not be wrong for you and it is not uh, whether it's the right or the wrong thing. Right now, he is saying if it, you're forcing it upon someone and they have not come to a point where they are able to accept it, don't force it because it will become a yeah, problem for them and uh, if they walk against their conscience, it is, going to be, it is going to destroy them. They are going to be pushed into guilt. Be very careful, therefore, he says, be sympathetic to other cultures, other ways of life, and don't ever say, oh, am I in a superior? Yeah, it could be. Try to talk to them. Dialoguing is okay. But at the same time, let others, be, others' faith not be destroyed by my simple things like eating and drinking and you know uh, my food habits and, and lifestyle and things like that and he goes on saying for even christ did not please himself so please other people instead of yourself and verse number 14 onwards chapter 15 verses 14 onwards i myself am convinced my brothers and sisters that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another yet i have written quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace god gave me to be a minister of christ jesus to the gentiles this is the responsibility that has been given to me and therefore he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of god so that the gentiles might become an off offering acceptable to god sanctified by the or by the holy spirit this is my responsibility to teach you and therefore i teach you so he is talking about how he is wanting and willing to serve them Beautiful. You know, again, the concept of love. I love people and therefore I'm willing to accept them, sympathize with them and even their, you know, different way of life. I love people and therefore I consider it my responsibility to serve them. Paul is saying, you know, certain things you might know, but I still want to write them to you. I still want to teach them to you because it is my responsibility as an apostle who's been sent to the Gentiles. You know, this was not, uh, this was, this is a voluntary thing that he has taken upon himself. Did they call him and say, you know, please teach us? Did the people? No. It's voluntarily done. And why is he doing that? Because for, of the passion and the love for people. So service, beautiful. Again, we find what he is saying. Like Jesus Christ did, therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, and uh, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. So he goes on saying how I am always for serving people in the capacity that I can. It's beautiful. May God help us. If we really love people, then we should be able to serve one another. What is the capacity in which you can serve? Paul is saying, I'm, I've been called to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. That's my passion. And therefore, I take it as a serious thing. I serve you. That's because the commandment, love one another. Do we have that aspect of serving? We understand that we always talk about serving God, but we don't talk about serving people, right? And uh, this is a problem because Jesus himself came to serve. And we need to be people who always understand this in the community, in the church, in the, in the place that we are. How, how, how serving are we to people? Lording over people is the usual, you know, innate quality in us, kind of, right? We always want to lord over people. We want to have the upper hand over people. But serving people and that too, voluntarily. Because when you do voluntary service, what happens is, anyone, you, know, you, you, you go and uh, fix someone's uh, 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 you know, car for, for free. 
all right? Or you go and uh, say, oh, your, your, your porch is all uh, dirty. Let me come and sweep it for you. They're going to respect you. What do you think? Because voluntary service does not, when something gets, give, gets given for free, that is not cherished at all. In fact, people will look at you and ask you, you know, they will look at you with suspicion, what does this person want, right? There is always this suspicion that comes with voluntary service because they think that there is some kind of an ulterior motive which will be there. You understand this? Why would they come and serve? And that always does not, that doesn't get cherished at all. When we do voluntary service, you know, this is the problem that comes along with that, that people don't cherish it. Whom do you cherish? Whom do you consider a celebrity? Not someone who comes and washes your feet. Who's a celebrity? Someone who claims to be a person to whom you should wash their feet, okay? When you say, when someone says, you know what, I'm such a great person, come and wash my feet, and that person is a celebrity, and that is happening in Christianity as well, and so, so, so very sad, okay? I've known people, literally I've seen a pe person, you know, uh, pastoring a huge congregation, this man standing and, 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 and uh, you know, saying my, 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 my shoes are tight, and there is a guy who comes running and, un uh, and unties his shoes. I literally saw this happen, okay? And uh, I was like, what is really happening? Okay, why can't you untie your shoe? Do you need someone to come and untie your shoe? Are you such a great person? Jesus Christ washes disciples' feet, and how dare you, you know, uh, claim yourself to be a person? I mean, if someone does that, would you even allow that? Should you even allow that? What do you think? Are we so great people? I mean, certain things, certain helps are okay, but menial things, should we even allow that? Let's be people who serve rather than lord over. I know service comes with a lot of problems. You know how many Christian organizations have been closed down? lot of them, okay? And any social service that is done are, is immediately looked at with suspicion and immediately social media is going to portray it as, you know, conversion. And uh, look at all these things that are happening. Look at how the world looks at things. If you do service, this is the reward that you get. You understand? You go and say, oh, let me serve you. This is the reward that you get. But Jesus or Paul says, this is the kingdom of God. You serve. Voluntary service, and again, voluntary service rendered, you can't ask, you can't... Uh, but, uh, you can't produce a bill for that, right? I come and sweep your porch and uh, give you a bill. Hmm. Can I do that? So voluntary service also has no remuneration. You can't demand anything. You can't go out and say, hey, I spent my whole time working for you. I spent my whole life, you know, slogging for you. Please do something for me. You can't. That's the way it is. But still, as I told you, that is voluntary. Jesus did that. He is God himself. But he stepped down and it was a voluntary submission. He could have been considered equal with equality with God because he is God himself. But he emptied himself, humbled himself, and that is service. Why? Because he loved us. Love one another, therefore sympathize. Don't be judgmental. Love one another and therefore serve. Then he goes on in verse number 25 onwards. But now that uh, there is no more place for me to work in these regions, you know, he's going on talking about how he was always wanting to preach the gospel to people who have not heard him. And now he says, I have done all that. I have served people. And now I have no more place to go because every place uh, I could go have already been visited by me. He is longing to visit them. And I plan to do so where I go, when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. And then he goes on. Now, however, he's got a mission now. Before I come to you, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it and indeed they owe it to them. So here he is saying, what is this mission? Paul is, has taught many people in Achaia, Macedonia. What is, he, what, what, what is his mission now? He's going to Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? What have the people of Achaia and Macedonia done? They have contributed to the poor. And he's taking that support there. He is the one who already, you know, went about and talked to people and said, we need to support people who are, yeah, who don't have. Jerusalem, you know, is right now poor. And the brothers and sisters there are in poverty. And it is your duty to support them. If you love one another, sympathize, serve, and support. Very important. Sometimes all that we do is not do that, really. Because we don't, why do we need to support? Why do we need to help someone who's in need? What should you give? 
because when we, when we say give to god it's it's uh, you know we are we are spiritualizing it where we say god is no man's debtor I, look at this this is how we exploit scripture you give to god and god is no man's debtor and therefore and how is he going to give he's not a man to give just what he gave he is god what is he going to give you're not heard sermons like that i'm not preaching that sermon now okay yeah don't mistake me don't take it out of context this is the sermon that we usually hear god is not a human being so he is going to take that and he is going to multiply hallelujah and you don't give to god uh, people you give to god you you give to the pastor you give to the leader who or who is and we don't know what he is doing with that and they and and, the, and and supposedly god is going to multiply it and he is going to put it in a jar and shake it down and put it and and pour it down your lap no yeah right you are not you are not accustomed to those preachings because you come to <laughs> you know you've been a part for a long time i think you're not heard those preachings but this is how we understand why do we why do we support why do we give we give because we want to get back investment i put 100 rupees how much will i get back if i put in the bank i might get i don't know 101 102 rupee if i put in sip i don't know maybe like 5 rupees or something you get extra if you give to god he is not just like the human being he is going to multiply he is going to give you 200 rupees and that's why you give <laughs> sorry you don't give for that you can't give god if someone tells you you can give god they are lying through their teeth because you can't give god because the, that's a wrong theology why can't you give to god because he doesn't need anything one he is self sufficient two he is incorporeal he doesn't have a body whatever you give is still physical and it's, it's of no use to him three everything that you can ever give still belongs to him because you can't create anything you take something that belongs to him and goes and give to him you can't give god so what do you give you give people all that the church does is pray we pray for your brother god's going to do great things for you i drive an i drive an audi right not me i'm saying you ask god god's going to give you an audi right that's our prayer that's our understanding support give and paul has talked to, spoken to them that much that akaya macedonia these people you know have given and paul is taking that to jerusalem and he is giving that to them and he says this is the support that i because because that's why that's how i know that i love one another you know that's the that's the commandment that fulfills, fulfills all the commandment may god help us right so may god help us to give right so we talked about sympathizing considering everybody without having prejudices to serving voluntarily no matter whether you get rewarded or stamped over it doesn't matter free support right may god help us and paul says this is how you love one another and this is a command don't put it off time is too short do it so that not so that you will get something out of it but because you are already a part of the kingdom of god and you want to bring more people into the kingdom of god may god help us let's bow down our heads and look to the lord and pray